Hey everybody, this is George from, what is my website? What does that say? Di DinosaurGeorge.com. Huh, that's a cool website. When did we come up with that? <laughs> no kidding. All right, <laughs> uh, let's get into it. My buddy Ray from Corpus Christi, Texas. Ray says, why was your television show called Jurassic Fight Club when only some of the dinosaurs are from the Jurassic period? Ray, that's a cool question. First of all, buddy, uh, how is football going? I hope you, uh, you and your team are doing well. I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to find time to go have dinner with you and your family, Ray. I would have loved to. I tell you something, uh, I really, really like your family, Ray. Your mom and dad are the, probably the coolest parents I've ever met. Um, <coughs> rock and roll! <laughs> They're some of the coolest people I've ever met, and I wish I would have had a chance to have dinner with you guys. But anyway, um, here's why it was called Jurassic Fight Club. The, the decision to name it that was from the History Channel. I had no input onto what the name was called. They kind of thought they would take advantage, of course, of the fame of the word Jurassic coming from Jurassic Park. Um, clearly, there were animals from the Miocene period. There were animals from the Pleistocene. There was Cretaceous. There was Jurassic. So um, the name was simply chosen. It would be tough to name it something other than maybe Paleo, paleo Fight Club, that might have been something that would have been more encompassing, but that's why they chose the name, Ray. It really had nothing to do with what animals were in it. All right, Jaden from Cabo de Praia, Azores, Portugal. Hello, George. Hello, Jaden. I hope you are feeling well, and here's what I've been wondering. Compsonathus looks like it's too small to give birth. I thought Compsonathus is just something that never grew up and possibly could grow to the size of maybe Ceratosaurus because Compi's eggs probably couldn't take in enough oxygen to give the embryo to get to the embryos inside. Do you agree with my hypothesis? Thank you for answering my questions and I hope you have a great day. Well, Jaden, thank you very much for asking your question and I hope you have a great day too. Um, yeah, when you look at Compsonathus, that's a tiny little dinosaur and I can understand why you might wonder whether or not that just represented a baby of something else. But there's ways we can determine whether we're looking at the baby or whether we're looking at the adult of a particular species. A lot of it has to do with the skull. In a baby, the skull has to be loose fitting. The bones in the skull are loose fitting so that it can continue to allow it to grow. But um, in an adult, the skull stops growing after, I, I wanna say it's probably up into the teenage years for humans, I think. Um, the, the reason for that or the reason why we can tell that is because there are things called suture lines. That's kind of sort of how the bones are connected. And in an adult, those suture lines have been solidified, meaning there's no more room for growth. Uh, whereas in a baby, they're not they're not connected yet to each other. They're more loose fitting. So looking at Compsonathus, that's clearly a, an adult dinosaur. So the question then is, well, then how on earth could the egg survive if he was that tiny? Think about a hummingbird. Look at modern day hummingbirds. Their eggs are absolutely minuscule and yet the hummingbird is more than capable of laying them. The babies are more than capable of getting oxygen and therefore they hatch and grow up to become adult hummingbirds. So the same thing would have been true with Compsonathus. It simply means that it eggs, its eggs would have been very tiny and yet the eggs would have been more than capable of hatching into baby compies and growing up into adult compies. So I appreciate and understand your question, Jaden, and I appreciate the fact that you're looking at things from that point of view. That's a very good question. Nobody's ever asked me that before. Uh, you know, there's one other possibility out there. This ha there's no, I don't see any evidence to support this, but I say it's a possibility. What if some little dinosaurs had live birth? much like some snakes have live birth. What if that were the case? Um, they would be born a little bit bigger than they would had they been born from inside of an egg. They wouldn't have the same confined space to mature before they were born. So uh, it may be possible that some dinosaurs gave live birth. So these tiny ones may not have laid tiny eggs. They just may have had baby, uh, very uh, large in comparison to body size, large babies. Um, we don't know, but let me tell you this, I, do have, I, I don't think there's any doubt that they would have been capable of laying tiny eggs and the babies would have been more than capable of uh, hatching. Okay, my buddy from Facebook, Montrez from Al Albana, Albany, Georgia, man, <laughs> Albany, Georgia, it's early in the morning here. Uh, do dinosaurs represent intelligence through size? For example, a raptor is smaller than Tyrannosaurus, so... In order for a raptor to survive, it would use its brain as its means of defense. T-Rex, on the other hand, wouldn't use it because he's just gigantic. That is a very cool question, Montrez. That's really a cool question. Um, 
certainly a larger brain for a smaller animal is more important because it does give it and maybe an advantage to be able to survive. When you are giant, when you're huge, you may not necessarily need a giant brain to survive. But let me let me go back and say this uh, first. Uh, brute force doesn't always make you successful in the animal kingdom. You have to have a brain behind you. The biggest animal in the world can do something really dumb and end its life. And Tyrannosaurus rex was very successful, therefore, it suggests that it had enough intelligence to survive generation after generation after generation. So um, size doesn't make that much of a difference in my opinion. Brain to body size is what's important. Now it would be true that if you were a big dinosaur like Stegosaurus and you had a tiny brain, you probably weren't as advanced as a small dinosaur, say Truodon, who has a very big brain. Um, I think brain to body size is what determines intellect. And when we look at a lot of different dinosaurs, their brain to body size was not, um, was not so dramatically different between gigantic dinosaurs and small dinosaurs. Um, I think Tyrannosaurus relied on that brain more than we give him credit for. His brain is pretty big. But I do agree with you that in my opinion, the raptors being smaller had a larger brain compared to their body size, which meant that probably gave them a little bit of an intellectual advantage. So in short, T-Rex, dumb, raptor, smart. <laughs> I'm kidding, you guys. All right, Ethan from Nexar Malta, my buddy Ethan. He says, hello, DG. Do you think abelosaurs were very active since their end orbital fenestras are enlarged? Thanks, Ethan. Wow. Nice question. The antorbital fenestra, what, what Ethan's talking about, is when you look at the skull of a dinosaur, a theropod especially, you'll notice that it has a very big opening in its skull. Most people misidentify that as the eye, the orbit, but that's not. Uh, the orbit is usually the second hole from the back of the skull, but it's always the second hole from the back of the skull. The third hole is that big one called the antorbital fenestra. It's gigantic. And the concept behind it is that it might have been used as a way to allow excess body heat to escape the brain, therefore keeping the brain cool. So Ethan's question is, if it has a larger opening, then it would naturally release more heat. Therefore, it would allow abelosauruses to be more active. That, Ethan, is genius, my friend. That's in incredible thinking. That's a great way to put uh, science and common sense together to formulate a pretty interesting idea. So the answer to your question is absolutely not. <laughs> I'm kidding you. I'm kidding you. The answer is, yeah, I do think that that would have been helpful if, in fact, the anorbital fenestra was used to lose excess heat then it would suggest a very active lifestyle if it was big compared to the skull. And if Abelosaurus's antorbital fenestra is extra large, then that would suggest to me that it was extra active. That is genius. Absolute genius, Ethan. Very proud of you. All right, uh, John John or Jan Jan from Naga City, Philippines. Who would win in a fight against Megalosaurus and Allosaurus? Well, since Allosaurus is my favorite dinosaur, Jan Jan, it clearly would probably be eh, probably Megalosaurus. <laughs> I think Megalosaurus might have an advantage over Allosaurus in that it was a little, I think, a little heavier duty. Uh, I think it may have been capable of taking on my beloved Allosaurus. That makes me sick to say that. But I do think Megalosaurus may have been even a little more advanced. Uh, even though Allosaurus is an amazing dinosaur, Megalosaurus is no slouch. So more than likely it would be Megalosaurus. That breaks my heart to say that, man. But what can you do? I'm sworn to honor in the paleontological world, and I must give you the facts. Who came up with that idea? I like it better when I can just make stuff up on the fly. All right, you guys, listen, thank you all so very much. Um, uh, if you've got a question, go to my website, dinosaurgeorge.com, and uh, go to the Ask Dinosaur George page, fill out the form and send it to me. I'll do my best to answer you. You young people out there, practice your reading. Everybody else out there, including you young people out there, practice your good manners. I'll talk to you guys soon. Take care.